Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's um, great to see you all virtually. Uh, my name is Jen McCann, and I'm with the University of Rhode Island Coastal Resources Center and Rhode Island Sea Grant. And uh, this is the first uh, meeting uh, for the aquaculture element, um, which is part of the Narragansett Bay Special Area Management Plan. So wonderful to see you all. Uh, I'm just gonna go over a little bit of housekeeping and then pass it over to Jim Boyd. Um, the purpose of today's meeting is to communicate the overall Bay Sand aquaculture element, the pur purpose, the process that we're gonna use and expectations. And then we're going to identify some working group information needs that you may have to assist with the development of, the, um, of an informed process and product. You should have all received an agenda um, which um, will guide us in uh, the discussion today. And um, I know we're all virtual and um, we're eager to get together. So we're trying to make this meeting as um, in-person as we can. Uh, so this is the reason why we chose this forum of everyone being able to see each other. Um, and as you know, that, that might, uh, we're hoping it will work. So we really appreciate you all putting yourself on mute. Um, unless we call on you, if that's at all possible, uh, we would appreciate that. Uh, again, we're trying as much as possible to make this an, an informal conversation, uh, but we need to um, keep people on mute um, while people are presenting. Um, so this is the way we're gonna have it. If, is, if you guys, if one of you has a question or you would like to say something, if you could use the chat, the chat room, and put the, put the letter Q in it. So I'm gonna do it right now. Um, and that will give us an uh, um, indication that you have a question, okay? So just put the letter Q in the chat and then we will call on you um, uh, when we get to the Q and A section or um, when we're going through the informational needs. So that's how we'll, um, uh, that's how we'll organize the process. I hope that makes sense. So um, with that, again, we're very happy to have you here. I'm going to pass it off to um, Jim Boyd. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you all this evening on behalf of the Coastal Resources Management Council. And we are grateful for your interest and participation as we begin this important work of the aquaculture element of the Narragansett Bay Special Area Management Plan, also known as the Bay Samp. The concept of the Bay Samp began several years ago when the CRMC was reviewing a federal consistency request by the US Navy for a proposed federal activity within Narragansett Bay. We recognize that some of our existing policies for the waters of Narragansett Bay many written over 40 years ago, were not nearly as comprehensive or as current as those within the ocean special area management plan. Hence, we wanted to improve upon and add more detailed policies and standards for the waters of Narragansett Bay using an ecosystem-based approach for such activities as renewable energy, water-dependent commercial, and recreational uses, aquaculture, and other water-dependent activities. This was the genesis of developing a Narragansett Bay SAMP to address important coastal management issues of concern within Narragansett Bay. Stakeholder engagement has been the key to developing successful SAMPs over the past 40 years of the Rhode Island Coastal Program, and this Bay SAMP will be our ninth special area management plan. When we first started development of the BASEM, the issue of renewable energy was fast becoming a high priority for the state. What became evident then was the priority issue of developing a renewable energy cable corridor within state waters to provide a service connection between offshore wind farms providing renewable energy to Rhode Island. That effort, became the first so-called element of the base amp. This current effort to address aquaculture 
development within Narragansett Bay is another priority that we are now able to devote resources and time with stakeholder engagement and input to develop a comprehensive aquaculture element that will guide aquaculture applications through the CRMC regulatory review process. Our expectation is that this aquaculture element will identify areas within Narragansett Bay that minimize impacts to natural resources and existing uses from proposed aquaculture farms. It will look at existing information, processes, and recommendations to improve the CRMC regulatory review process. And this will be accomplished by engaging folks like you to help us collectively better understand the issues facing the users and uses of the Bay. We look forward to working with you all as we advance this project as part of the Narragansett Bay SAMP. And again, thank you for your participation. I will uh, hand it off now to uh, the CRMC Aquaculture Coordinator, Ben Getch, to just further briefly explain what is the aquaculture element of the Bay SAMP. Thanks, Jim. And just before Ben, you start, I, again, I just, if you have any questions, or uh, please put the letter Q, type the letter Q in the chat room. Go ahead, Ben. Hi. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jen. Uh, my name is Ben Getch. I am the uh, aquaculture coordinator here at CRMC. Um, so you heard a little bit from Jim about um, what the Bay SAMP is, and we are here uh, to discuss the aquaculture element of the Bay SAMP. And uh, the, the goal is to develop an aquaculture element uh, for the Bay SAMP uh, to help guide the development of aquaculture through the CRMC regulatory process while minimizing its effects on natural resources and, and existing uses. Now, uh, it's, a pretty, um, you know, it's a pretty complicated task. So to do this, we're going to have to um, you know, review natural physical resources, uh, all the data uh, sets associated with those, uh, identify the data we have, and we made the data we, 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 could, we could obtain or would like to have. Um, but all this information uh, for the development of the aquaculture element will end up on a, on a map. And this would be uh, the, the main component of the aquaculture element would be, would be a, a map to guide aquaculture development in the Bay. Now the 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 map would um, you know obviously have many different layers and analysis of those layers uh, would, would will take some time and we're going to try to work through that as a group um, perhaps you know targeted uh, on certain topics or geographical areas. Um, you know, I should mention that the the project boundary for this map is uh, the bay. But that also includes the Sakonet River, of course. Um, and basically, you know, the mouth, the mouth down to the mouth of the bay, which would be Point Judith, uh, to Beaver Tail, to Newport, and then kind of over to Sakonet Point. And uh, our our current project area also extends, uh, you know, up to the hurricane barrier uh, in, in Providence. So we, we are looking at the entire bay here. Um, you know, in addition to the map, the, the map will hopefully become part of our, our Red Book, which is our Coastal Resource Management Program, the regulations that, that CRMC uh, abides by. And we also hope to uh, build upon the existing CRMC inclusive aquaculture review process, which is our existing process, uh, to, pri to provide for additional analytical and, and professional data uh, to be available in, in the reviews of those applications. And also as part of this uh, aquaculture element, uh, we, we may develop some further guidance uh, that's maybe not uh, regulatory in nature, uh, but would um, you know, help guide things like gear selection, uh, site selection, um, you know, beyond what the, the map might end up uh, eventually being uh, as incorporated into our, our regulation. Um, but with that said, uh, you know, I'm happy to see so many people uh, coming out tonight, being interested. Uh, the success of this program is, is stakeholder driven. It's largely dependent on, on you know, the, the stakeholders uh, participating 
uh, in this in this public process. So, thank you very much. Great, thank you, Ben. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Jim or Ben concerning the scope of this process or uh, the, pro the public process or the locations? I don't see any queue queues in the, the chat room. So, so Jen, while people are thinking about some questions, uh, perhaps the the one thing I'd like to add is. Um, I'd like to think of this um, aquaculture element as a marine spatial planning exercise, uh, not unlike what was done for the ocean SAM. So it will be a mapping exercise to look at a number of different existing data uses. You know, we would be looking at things like harbor management boundaries, uh, existing aquaculture sites, um, areas of, of high fishing activity, uh, recreational uses. There's a whole range of, uh, of sort of map layers that uh, some of which Ben described that we would be using to essentially look at um, sort of an exclusionary uh, uh, process. And ultimately a map would be produced coming out of this effort uh, that would determine where the most appropriate areas within the Bay as described by Ben, where we think aquaculture uh, could be appropriately cited uh, and still have to go through the CRMC regulatory review process, just like any other aquaculture project does today. Uh, but it would help um, address a lot of stakeholder uh, issues. And that map uh, we anticipate we would um, um, integrate into as part of a regulatory adoption into our red book, which is uh, our rules and regulations uh, covering uh, activities uh, within Rhode Island's coastal zone. So that's, that's what we think of the aquaculture element as. And we're certainly looking forward to uh, engagement with you on some further ideas and some input so that we can have an, a successful outcome here with the aquaculture element. Great, thank you, Jim. So um, we do have one question from Dick Pastore. Dick, you wanna unmute yourself and um, ask the question. And I would suggest Ben or Jim to talk a bit about, remember yesterday we were talking about the different regions and how we might approach it that way. But Dick, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask the question? Oh, I can't hear you. Can you un... Um, There you go. Thank you. Did you do it or did I do it? I don't know. <laughs> I think you did it because I couldn't okay. do it. Anyways, so well, power. No, <laughs> that's okay. Hi, everybody. Jimmy, thank you for the introduction. You're welcome. Mike, how are you? Um, so, did you guys have you guys put together a, an outline of specifically what we're going to do? I mean, I understand the general approach. Have, well, we thought about, have we thought about doing how we're going to approach all this? Because as the email I sent to you and everybody else recently, I think there's a whole lot to this. And I think everybody understands that it's fairly complex. Yeah, it is complex, Dick, in terms of there's a lot of information out, out there. However, um, we think that there is um, relevant information. We don't have to go and do an exhaustive search of data layers to look at to develop uh, sort of an exclusionary mapping process, if you will, but there is a lot of relevant information out there. Um, we've developed a scoping document as part of the Narragansett Bay SAMP. And from that, we'll put together a more detailed process for how we think that this aquaculture element can proceed forward. And tonight, uh, however, we wanted to kick off the process and, and get some input from folks before we finalize that sort of scoping process, if you will, to make sure that we're inclusive of ideas for how people think might be a good way to proceed. We're certainly looking, uh, and we'll talk a, a little bit more on next steps at the end of the meeting, but one of the things that we're looking at, for example, is to um, focus in on some regional areas. So we're thinking about West Bay, 
East Bay and the Sakonet River, where we would actually hold separate uh, sort of regional meetings, if you will, for those three areas to see if there are issues of commonality or whether there's some issues very specific to East Bay or Sakonet River or West Bay. And all of those ideas will filter through and we'll look at some common elements and then also address something that might be very specific, for example, within the Sakonet River. So all of those will help uh, develop this mapping uh, exercise. But that's, that's it in a nutshell uh, in terms of what we want to develop out of the aquaculture element. So, so and, and I've talked about this numbers of times and I've talked to Lisa about it and I've talked to Ben about it and you've heard me bitch about it a lot. So there is, I think, as I said in the email, I mean, you have the, 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 you know, the biological and the physical oceanographic stuff for the aquaculture, and I get that, but there's a lot of onshore stuff, and I get the nimbyism where people don't want to see the floating cages, yada, 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 et cetera, but everybody gets a voice. So there, I, I see conflicts with other fisheries. I also see conflicts with some of the CRMC type waters where you can put a mooring on out off your property because you're in a type one water, you can't put a dock. However, you have a, a leasing process which may give away that area to an aquaculture lease. And I think that there's a lot of zoning issues that are onshore that have not been, that have not been addressed. And I also think that although you guys have done your best to try to put in, putting a notification together for these leases, I, I and looking back from my EPA days, we had an A95 process for public, public participation, public notification. There doesn't seem to be any kind of a formalized stakeholder notification process that has been developed yet. And I know that that's your intent, but I, there, it's not something you can just do, kind of everybody sits around and thinks about it. You need to formalize it somehow so that you don't end up with all the problems that we see at the shellfish, uh, the shellfish advisory panel. And, and, and I mean, Mike can talk to that too, I think. Give me. Yeah, um, understood, Dick. And, and we know that, um, uh, there have been issues raised with the notification process. Um, you know, when we have a project that's on land, it's it's easy to have an applicant identify the abutting landowners to that proposed project, not dissimilar to zoning applications for right. you know somebody who's going to build an addition on their house. Yep. The the abutting neighbors get notified, right? Only common. Um, it's more difficult when you have a project that might be a half a mile offshore out in the middle of the bay. Well, who needs to be notified and how far away? Um, so we're looking for some ideas in terms of the process, the regulatory process that will be helpful. And we can integrate those into our regulatory process through this Narragansett Bay uh, aquaculture element. So it's process issues, and then it's also developing, for lack of a better term, an aquaculture map. And, and the two are not mutually exclusive, and I'm sure ideas are going to flow up from uh, stakeholder input as to how we can improve both the process of notification uh, to enhance our existing regulatory process, but then also the the mapping effort will also help address stakeholder concerns so that we're citing aquaculture in areas where, you know, more or less have been, uh, uh, we'll say, have been agreed to, if you will, for the most part. I, I get that, Jimmy, but I, I, and I understand all that, but I just, we haven't seen how you're going to try to do this on a, on a, on a real, on a, and maybe you're saying you've got it. You, you know, it's in the file. We're going to give you guys, we're going to give, give it to you guys later. But I think we need to see how we're going to get to this. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Understood. Nope. I don't Understood. want to be the dead horse. Let's yep. to the, uh, uh, so Cam, do you want to unmute yourself? And you have a question as well. Cam. Sure. Um, I know five years ago, like North Carolina hired Virginia Tech uh, to develop their sighting tool. And I was wondering for uh, Jim and Ben, is there a, specific state that you're going to emulate in terms of like features. And I've used the CRMC one that you have now. Um, is there anything that we should be looking at as the model that, that you're considering? Uh, ben, did you have some 
thoughts on that? I know that you've worked with Roger Williams University. Yeah, so, um, yes, Roger Williams uh, Marine Affairs Institute, which is based at the law school there, uh, has been working on a, a program, uh, aquaculture siting tool, uh, which is um, actually based on the Massachusetts model. Got it. And it's called uh, Shellfast. Uh, that the, the, the Massachusetts uh, version is up and running. Um, the Rhode Island uh, version is still in, in the beta form, um, but I've been able to use both, both tools uh, and, and they, are, they are powerful in, a, in the way that you can overlap data and, and add on, analyze a, an area for potential site selection. Um, you know, it's, it's no uh, substitute for the, the rigorous review process that every application goes through, but it, it does, um, it does give you a lot of information up front that's, that's important. Um, you know, I think the difference between, between the, the shell fast uh, tool uh, and uh, what we're trying to do with our aquaculture element uh, map is, you know, the map itself would actually have some, some regulatory, I mean, it would be part of our regulations incorporated into the, into the red book. Um, you know, the siting tool, I, I think it's similar, has similar uh, information on it and, it and it's interactive in nature. Um, so it's, it's more of a, a tool in that sense, but the, the element you know, map that we're trying to come up with, I think would, you know, would, would obviously not be uh, an interactive uh, mapping program in, in that way, but would, would hopefully have the same, same data, be driven by the same data and, and data layers. Cool, thank you. Okay, and um, then we have uh, Peter Payton. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm just curious what the timeline is for developing these different data layers and then developing this final map product might be. Oh, good question, uh, Pete. Um, so we're trying to do this as quickly as possible. Uh, we want to advance this effort through the you know summer and fall, and that um, you know our hope and expectation is that by the end of this calendar year that we have a product that um, we think is ready to go through a, a public notice and review and council approval to be integrated uh, into our red book process. So we're gonna try and advance this as quick as we can. It may take a little bit longer than the timeline that I just mentioned, but um, that's our hope anyway. Okay. Peter, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, Marta. Hello, thank you. Um, so I guess I think I need a little bit more of, of a clarification about how the map is going to be integrated in the red book and how it's going to be used. Um, in, and maybe giving a, me an example could, could help me understand um, how it's part of the regulatory process. So are you envisioning that there are areas that are going to be closed for aquaculture or open for aquaculture, like the, you know, water management area or, and, and, and that relates to my question about how adaptive the process is because things change. So how in, in um, our, you know, our knowledge of the Bay and, and, and the processes that affect aquaculture and other users also change. So that's how, it relates and how would you expect the process to be? And may, that may be something we work out through this, but I just had that question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marta, uh, great question. Uh, yes, uh, we would hope that it would be um, an adaptive process. Um, you know, rule, rule making um, uh, is never an easy process. And once you establish something in rule, um, it, they can always be amended as you go out. Um, our hope is that we, um, you know, using a carpentry term, hit the nail on the head here with all this stakeholder engagement and input as we start developing these layers. An example that you wanted to ask about was how, how would you use these maps? Um, one example that we have in our program uh, is the CRMC water type maps. There are certain activities that are prohibited in certain water use sheets. Um, what we would anticipate with an aquaculture map that gets incorporated into um, our regulations is that the areas, uh, and, and, and this is undecided right now, this could be 
an exclusionary zone that basically says in these areas, aquaculture um, is not encouraged or not permitted. Uh, alternatively, it could be areas where aquaculture, where we're asking people that if they're considering doing aquaculture within the bay, that they look within these certain mapped areas within the bay as they would be looked upon more favorably. Uh, that doesn't mean uh, that you couldn't apply for something elsewhere, but if you do, it's going to get a lot more scrutiny and not looked upon favorably. Simply put, that's how we're looking at it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, Scott. Hi, Jen. Hi. Um, and hi, Jim. Hi, Scott. So, so I'm, I'm Scott McWilliams from University of Rhode Island. And Jim, I'm interested in this analogy uh, with the ocean sand. So you just sort of outlined in response to Marta's question, um, a process that basically is how the ocean sand was used by uh, folks who wanted to put any kind of wind energy facility out in the ocean. They, they, had, they had options and we outlined those nicely in the ocean sand and they could use that to their favor or if they wanted to, to row a tougher road, they could. Um, so one of the processes that we went through with the ocean sand but I didn't hear us talk about yet, was there was a pretty lengthy needs assessment that was done. Because there's a lot of stuff that we didn't know. And it was, it was determined that there were certain things that needed to be known to really effectively put together an ocean SAMP that would withstand the test of time and scrutiny. And uh, Peter Payton and I were involved in the bird stuff related to that. And part of the reason why there was a needs assessment that said we needed more information was there was already a lot of scrutiny in other states about what was happening in terms of potential impacts on birds. So I'm wondering if uh, that process has already been done. And if not, maybe what, what should be done um, to do that, sort of getting a Dick's question of what should be the process. It seems like that's a, a first a first step that probably needs to be made, but I'm, you might have already done that. Thank you, Scott. That's a great question and a very good example. And, and you know, you're in reference to, for example, the uh, renewable energy zone uh, that was determined as part of the information gathered. There was a lot of unknowns. Um, what I will say is, uh, yes, we've started that needs assessment. We have it uh, we have some details fleshed out. We're looking for more information on the needs assessment, and we're going to look to stakeholders to help us flesh that out more. So we'll we'll get the bones of that out to you. Uh, that is part of the scoping document, and uh, we want to build on that needs assessment. What I would add is, however, um, and I think many of the URI scientists um, uh, would agree, that Narragansett Bay is probably one of the most well-studied estuaries in the country. There's been study after study for decades of existing information within uh, Narragansett Bay. Um, uh, unlike, um, you know, the ocean samp area where there was, you know, a dearth of information going back even 50 years. So there was a big data gap to fill. We don't believe that we have to undertake that type of analysis in Narragansett Bay because there's already a lot of existing, very relevant data uh, layers um, that will be helpful in looking at um, this aquaculture mapping exercise. So the needs assessment, you're correct. Uh, we need to get a more detailed needs assessment put together and we'll get um, out to um, this ad hoc group, uh, the beginnings of that needs assessment. And we're gonna look to you all to help us uh, what you believe is also an important uh, piece of information that should be considered in this process. Great to hear that there's still room for input on that. Absolutely, that's, that's why we're engaging in this process. Okay, thank you. Um, Charles, I... I know you, uh, it, you're next, so why don't you unmute yourself? And please remember, you can put a, a cue in the chat room and we will call on you. Okay, 
So I just did that, but I raised my hand, so. Very good. Anyway, uh, I'd like to suggest that Suffolk County on Long Island is equally good, if not better than a Massachusetts analogy to Narragansett Bay. Peconic Bays, you may be familiar with, are a rather large area between the two forks, right? With uh, large areas, various channels, wetlands, say nothing about the South Shore Bays. So I'd like to strongly recommend that in addition to Massachusetts, you consider Suffolk counties. Plans on that and Jen, I've sent you a link so that you can uh, share that if the uh, CMRC's committees decide to use it. Thank you, Charles. Yeah. Go ahead. yeah, I'm just gonna say thank you. Uh, I, I was not aware of the that particular example. Uh, perhaps Ben is though, but thank you very much. Um, hey, Jen, just yeah. one thing as we call on people, um, it, it, I think it would be helpful for everyone uh, on this online meeting if if people would just just briefly introduce themselves and what group they might be representing or whether they're just a property owner along the shore or sure. representing a town or an organization, et cetera. Okay, let's start with Charles. Charles, tell us who you are. Yes, hi, I'm Chip Lawrence. I live in Tiverton. I look over the Sapalit Marsh. Uh -huh. Professionally, I'm a professor of applied mathematics at Brown University. My largest application is about climate change. You can bet I'm gonna be asking some questions concerning climate change and their impact on this. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. Okay, we all know Robbie Hudson. Robbie, why don't we, you show us your face and uh, ask your question. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm Rob Hudson. I'm Roger Williams University. I'm the shellfish hatchery manager and faculty member over there. Um, I've been part of a few of these plans before, so I understand Dick's saying that we have a lot of things going on already. Uh, we can tap into some of these old resources. But um, my question actually goes back to when I my Save the Bay days uh, with the hat on. And uh, it's, it's about the shellfish restoration. So we always have to fill out a, a shellfish restoration. We fill out an application. And in that application, it says aquaculture at the top is for uh, restoration and a few other things. But anyways, um, We've always had to go through either apply for the through the five percent rule. We have to do that in the, the coastal ponds in the bay. We're still going through as aquaculture. If we're going to exclude aquaculture from certain areas, uh, the impacts to the shellfish restoration community. Uh, I know TNC still has a, a project. NRCS has projects. I, I'm sure that some of them would get grandfathered in, but some of those sites are really good sites that should be considered uh, in the future not to be. Um, remove from the ability to use those sites and get the shellfish in there for restoration purposes. Great, great point, Rob. Thanks for bringing that forward. Uh, yes, technically, shellfish restoration, where you know organizations or you know U.S. Fish and Wildlife (NRCS) whoever are bringing shellfish and um, you know distributing seed or grown out uh, animals in certain areas to enhance the natural wild population, but they're not being um, grown out um, in a specific lease area for commercial purposes. It's really ecosystem restoration and perhaps being available for recreational or commercial harvest uh, at a later time. So we would not want to exclude uh, such activity uh, in other parts of the Bay, if um, they may not be uh, looked upon as favorable areas for aquaculture, per se, a commercial, uh, a commercial activity. So uh, that's a good point, and we'll make sure that we uh, consider that as part of this process. Great. Adam? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, Adam Silks, uh, American Muscle Harvesters in North Kingstown, Saltwater Farms in North Kingstown. Um, is this SAMP going to be a tool to develop a map and only a map? 
for where we think aquaculture should happen in the Bay, or is this gonna go into details on uh, species and gear type? Um, I don't know, boat side, any, any specifics like that? Um, or is that, though, does that remain to be seen with all the workshops that you guys have planned? Uh, Adam, that's a, a, a good question. I, I think right now what we're looking at essentially is a map uh, for appropriate areas of aquaculture. And we're aquaculture as defined in the coastal program. So it wouldn't limit gear type or types of operation. Uh, however, uh, there could be some additional information within the base amp itself that supports the map. And uh, Ben mentioned earlier, uh, potentially developing some very detailed guidance about what gear types and what types of operations are appropriate uh, in certain areas of the bay. Uh, ben, I don't know if you wanna uh, expand on that a little bit more, if you, if you think um, there's more detail there that I missed. Um, yeah, I, I think I think you're right. I think when it comes to things like gear types, and, and you know, that's probably something that might be better addressed through through certain guidance um, that we could incorporate in, into the program. Um, you know, likewise, uh, you know, with restoration of Robbie's point before, um, there might be certain guidance regarding restoration uh, and where where that might be appropriate or or. Or potentially, you know, if we have areas that we decided we want to exclude aquaculture from, maybe there are, um, you know, variance criteria that we could develop uh, to, to meet, um, you know, certain needs for things like restoration or, or different kinds of gear or the lack of gear because, you know, restoration doesn't use any, any gear for the most part. And there are other types of, you know, bottom planting operations that don't use any gear um, that might be appropriate in an area where gear might not be appropriate. So uh, that's, I think that's all I have to add to that. Okay. Um, anyone else have any other questions? If you want to put Q in the, the chat room, uh, we'll give it a minute. Oh, Lisa Breyer. Thank you. I, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say, Thank you. Uh, I think that this group is and this plan is going to be great. It's in response to many years of, of conversations and comments with Jamestown. And I think it's, um, I think it's, it's going to really go a long way in helping us define what happens around the island. Um, and it'll make your process easier, I think, if, if these things are identified, if these areas are identified. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and we're glad that you're participating in this process. And yes, Jamestown has been very vocal. Um, and, and frankly, uh, over the last uh, several years, there has been a lot of activity, aquaculture activity around Jamestown. So we appreciate uh, uh, your input and, and Jamie's input and, and you know residents that you're representing to help us in this process. And I agree that uh, at the end of, of this, we are very uh, hopeful and, and uh, expectant that, uh, that this will result in um, a, a more desirable permitting process for aquaculture that addresses uh, users' needs and stakeholder needs, for sure. OK, great. All right, Dick wants to ask Adam a question. Adam, can we put you on the spot? Yes. All right, Dick, go for it. You're on mute. Adam, would it be more helpful if the gear type, if we got into more specifics about gear type and all that stuff, or would it be better if the applications were judged on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on what's going on with that specific spot? Yeah, I, I, there, I guess the reason I asked is because, I mean, Narragansett Bay is a pretty small estuary uh, overall, um, but there's a lot of municipalities that, you know, have stake there. So 
every yeah. town, every town. I mean, I've had experience with uh, one, two, only three different towns um, with applications and every town's different. Um, I think as far as gear types and species, I think it's remained uh, on a case by case basis. But one thing that I like that North Kingstown, I think has taken a good proactive approach on is I think within the last couple of years, they've made, I don't know if it, existing applicate or existing leases, but maybe, maybe existing ones as well as new ones all have to have on the Northwest corner it has to have this kind of buoy and, right. and it makes it easier for, for the, for uh, any user of the Bay, um, whether a, a, someone who has been on the Bay for the past 40 years or someone who has been, you know, they just bought a boat this year. If, if if we could incorporate that into this program where every every application is a case by case basis within that town but overall if every lease is organized the same it's going to be easier for every user on the bay to know like what's going on within that uh lease i guess my, actually mike and i i understand that i come out of whitford all the time and i know that we had generally we have reflector buoys on the corners because uh, if somebody's coming in at night um, and they don't know that that lease is there and it doesn't pop up on your GPS, you're going to have a big problem with both all your floating buoys and everybody's screws going through there. But my question was more specific to, the, there's been a lot of issues with the floating pontoon gear in uh, Dutch, Dutch Island Harbor, where it, it seems to be a conflict with a type one water where aesthetics are held as one of the major issues, one of the major, um, what shall I say, goals or whatever of the, of the type one water. And there's, I mean, people see the floating pontoons, they kind of look like they're, 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 depending on your perspective, they could, they could be very in, in, invasive or not, but there's been a lot of conflict with that. So my question was, I get the radar, the, the, the radar reflectors on the corners, but uh, I'm talking about more submerged cages versus you can do the pontoon cages and stuff like that, because that's where I've seen a lot of conflict with respect to visual issues that people come up with. Now, it, now we can do it case by case and see what's going on on shore, or we can try to try to drill down and say, you know what, uh, Dutch Island Harbor, no more pontoon, no more pontoon cages because we have so many complaints. I, I don't know what to say to you. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm just asking you for your opinion. That's all. Yeah, no, I, and <laughs> that's why I asked the question yeah. because I mean, we would never, I don't, I think it has to be a case by case. I, okay. I don't. Okay. That's fine. You know what I mean? I don't see how you can break in an area. No, I but. agree. Yeah. But, um, you know, both both uh, Adam and, and Dick bring up a good point here about um, consistency in terms of, of how a lease uh, goes out into uh, tidal waters of the state. And I think we've been pretty consistent, and, and Ben can, can correct me here, but we always get the you know, out of bound four corners, or if it's a Pentagon, you know, five corners, but generally they're rectangular, yep, that's right? right? And so we always get those four corner markers. And Dick, you're absolutely right that, um, you know, the, Mar Marta raised the issue about an adaptive process here. And that's exactly what's happening with aquaculture uh, since we've been permitting it back in the early seventies. Aquaculture, technology and methods are adaptive and the techniques are improving to get better yields and uh, floating gear uh, certainly in the last several years has become more and more prevalent. And frankly, that's uh, been generating um, a lot of uh, the issues raised by uh, uh, you know, property owners that, that live right along the shoreline, you know, the complaints about the aesthetics, uh, you know, to some people, they might not uh, be very aesthetic. To other people, uh, they may appreciate the fact that there's a working farm out there on the bay, right? So everyone has a different perspective, but 
uh, yes, gear type is going to be adaptive. 10 years from now, there could be something very different with aquaculture that gets permitted out in the bay. We just don't know what the advancing technology will bring us. So it has to be an adaptive process. Uh, um, you know, we'll certainly be, be looking to stakeholders here to provide some input on this issue. One way you could look at it is, are there certain areas where you wouldn't want to see floating gear, for example, but maybe submerged cages would be okay if you're in a certain water depth uh, versus in another area where it's fine to have floating cages because you're a certain distance from shore or you're in a certain water depth. I don't know. That could be something that comes out uh, of the input ideas here that, that gets developed through this process. But that's exactly why we're trying to uh, engage the stakeholders here to help us uh, get this uh, uh, process moving forward with the best considerations that we possibly can put together for this effort. So let me say something just philosophically. Okay, and then we're going to have someone else speak, okay? I'm sorry. Okay. Do you, no, go ahead, finish. But I'm just saying. We're, I, we're I was going to say, just let me say something philosophically. We have, we have a, 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 an aquaculture industry that is just, it's, it's a, in its nuanced stages, st uh, uh, stages and we have, a, we have a leg up on the entire country. And I think we need to do everything we can to support it. Okay, thank you. All right, Bruce, Bruce C. Hey, uh, Bruce Elko from the town of Portsmouth. Uh, I'm the Harbor Master here. And as you can tell, I'm a police officer as well. Um, <clears throat> I guess thinking outside the box real quick, you, know, you mentioned, um, you know, obviously the Bay, but then also Sakana River. Um, Jen, I, I don't know, Jen or Jim could answer this, but has there been any thought as to including anybody from uh, the offshore wind uh, company that's, that is allegedly going to connect in up at Brayton Point up at Somerset? Because if they're going to be coming up to Sakana River, it might be nice to know exactly what they're going to be doing. <clears throat> yeah, it's a good, uh, good question, Bruce. Um, we, we don't know the exact route uh, that wind companies might consider coming up into the Sakonet River. We've, we've had some preliminary discussions with a couple of wind farm companies over the years. Uh, and, and again, that was the genesis of, you know, sort of the Bay Samp and looking at a priority issue of cable corridors coming into the Bay. Uh, we know for sure that Revolution Wind which will be providing 400 megawatts of offshore wind energy to Rhode Island, has an export cable planned uh, coming up basically the middle of the West Passage and then making landfall at Quonset. For the Sakonet River, there's some conceptual plans about going up to the Sakonet River and then making their way up to Brayton Point. Uh, I can assure you that they're gonna take the deepest middle section of the Sakonet River that they can because they want to avoid uh, shallow water areas uh, because they don't want to have conflicts with that cable, uh, both with the installation process as well as with long-term maintenance. Uh, but yes, the wind farm uh, developers, once we are certain about any proposed cable route, that's going to be a consideration in this mapping process uh, as well. And uh, we will be engaging the uh, uh, offshore wind companies that either currently have plans coming into Rhode Island or might in the future have plans coming up into Rhode Island waters eventually to make it their way to Brayton Point. But that's, that's a good question, Bruce. Does that answer your question, Bruce? Okay, great. Charles, you had something else to add. Yes. So about the uh, markers on the corners, it's nice to have reflectors, radar reflectors. They're useful for those who have radar, but there's a lot of us who fish in foggy conditions. Many of us who fish for striped bass fish after dark, either before dawn or after dark. So having something that you can actually see if you don't have a radar. I note to you that while there are marks about where the fish traps might be, there are only radar reflectors. And as a result, there's a really 
each year it's trying to figure out where, what year did they put their traps where and exactly how are they laid out. Okay. Right now you can't get behind the one that comes to shore on the, uh, out at Sakonic Point. You got to go all the way around. You can, but, right? yeah. but regardless, you need some kind of way for folks who don't have radar to be able to see them. Yeah, I think uh, I think Ben can address that because we've been talking about lighted corner markers, you know, like solar battery operated uh, lights on these markers, along with the reflective tape on these markers. Ben, go ahead. Yeah, please. so, so I, it's, it's come about as kind of a standard stipulation or condition on an approval. Uh, for, for floating gear in an area that might be um, near navig navigational uh, area that uh, that you have both uh, the markers be both a, a high flyer radar reflector with a solar powered light so so that the light would would be an aid to navigation for for those who don't have radar or you know an additional aid for, for even for those who do uh, so you know you, you could spot these things you know, at least at night um, or in dark conditions. Okay, Cam, do you wanna, you had a question. Did you wanna elaborate on what you wrote in the chat? No, I think Ben handled that. I, I would say though that like three years ago I was reviewing an uh, application with the town planner of South Kingstown, Doug yeah. McLean. And I asked him what he looks for in an application. And he pointed out um, this camp where there was heavy recreational use. So if there was some way to identify that on the map, like uh, children boating or something like that, I can't speak to all the fisheries, but that might be useful in the future. Great. Yeah, I think that, you know, part of what we're looking for is, is you know, recreational use areas that are certainly, you know, well-known, heavily, heavily used. Uh, where certain types of aquaculture could, you know, present a conflict, certainly. Okay. Anybody else have um have a question or a comment? Jennifer, uh, if I might. Sure. Um, I actually, uh, I'm just looking at all the people who are uh, participants here, and I'd like to put. Uh, if they don't mind, a couple of people on the spot, just because I know them quite well, and I think that they might have a question, but maybe if I uh, sort of urge them to ask a question, they might. First, uh, I want to recognize Mike McGivney, who is the president of the Rhode Island Shell Fishermen's Association, and I thought I saw Dave Gigliotti on here uh, as well. And I'm just curious uh, if they have any thoughts that they want to share with this group. Okay. Am I out it? Yeah, we can hear you, Mike, but it sounds like your connection's a little broken up. Uh, okay. It was uh, Mike, you might want to try turning off your video. It, sometimes that helps. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's, yeah, it's probably your internet bandwidth there. Why does it work for my son? <laughs> <laughs> that's better. Yeah, that's better, Mike. We can hear you clearly now. Oh, okay. I, I didn't do anything. Well, we asked for this uh, sand plan about five years ago because the uh, a lot of aquaculture wannabes or, or people looking to get into it uh, had taken Dale Levitt's course. I think it was 150. And we had concerns going forward, you know, where these people would want to go. And we've dealt with several leases in areas that we thought were important that we had to follow right to the very end. And we're hoping to have areas um, set aside for various uses. And certainly the wild fisheries is one of them. You talked about being adaptive, which is a great idea, but I can tell you, Jim, I'm working the same areas I've been working for 43 years, uh, other than maybe the upper bay recently. Uh, but basically, we, you know, we have our areas that we pretty much, our beds that we work, and we just like to make the process so if something comes up, it, it can, you guys can say no to it and have a good reason, as opposed to in the past, we would have to follow it all the way through to Providence and, 
drag us, drag ourselves up there, at, you know, late at night and try to, you know, argue. We've been fortunate, but, you know, this would be very helpful for us moving forward. And we've, we've done something, you know, a long time ago that's been very helpful. We um, basically set aside an area at Rome Point that we, that we all agreed the fishermen was a, a, an area to, that could be utilized. And uh, it's been very successful to the point where now it's closed. So, you know, we've been in the process before, we've been part of the process and, we, you know, we've been working and we just think this would be very helpful for the fisheries and for the aquaculturists and everybody else who enjoys the bay. So uh, I don't know what the process is. I'm kind of waiting to see what you say the next step is. Uh, my guess is have everybody submit what they're looking to accomplish or to, to address or to deal with. So you have like a working uh, sheet to kind of go off with and the next time we meet. And hopefully that'll be in person. And then generally just kind of, you know, work, you know, we've done it with snail pots. Like an aquaculturist would want to go, you know, 50 yards offshore and, and a, a snail would say, hey, this is where I'd snail. If you go 100 yards offshore, you know, it's more, it's better for everyone. So just kind of working together, identifying these areas uh, and makes it better for everybody. And, and that's kind of what we're looking forward to. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Mike. I, pre I appreciate your comments. And uh, yes, we, we fully understand where the shell fishermen uh, are coming from on this issue. And, and uh, your idea of having people submit um, uh, their important issues uh, could be helpful for us to better flesh out uh, this process. And we're gonna we're gonna get to that in a minute. So we're gonna yeah. um, Dave. Do you have something you'd like to add to that? Me? me? Yes, you. <laughs> no, no. Um, I'm just really happy to see the process starting. Uh, more of a statement than a question. And thank okay. you. Um, I'm right. really happy to see the process starting. Um, it has been a concern for for the guys. Uh, for, you know, for my guys out there on the bay. Um, it's a conversation that happens often. So I'm really in, you know, looking forward to helping out with this and participating in whatever fashion I can to help you guys. And um, yeah, let's get the ball rolling. Thank you. Okay, great. We Thanks. got a couple more. Um, Fred, did you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, hi, Fred DeFinis. I'm a uh, recreational fisherman, uh, part-time sh shell fisherman and uh, member of the uh, RISA Legislative Committee. And my question is about this process. Or do we have a goal in terms of uh, number of acres or square miles or whatever that we'd like to identify for this? Or is this gonna be more of a uh, exclusionary process where we say uh, you know, anything that's not excluded it becomes a uh, fair game for aquaculture. Uh, well, Fred, thank you for that uh, question. We, we don't have a specific goal in terms of how many acres of the bay or what areas of the bay. We're looking forward to this process to help make a determination as to what should be appropriate areas for aquaculture uh, within the bay. So, um, we have no preconceived notions right now as to what that would be. And with the input of stakeholders through this process moving forward in the coming months, uh, we can flesh out some of those uh, issues to get to your question. Okay, yeah, you know, going back to Dick's comment before, uh, just as aquaculture is growing, and, and I think most of us here support that, um, there could be other uses uh, that we, we can't anticipate today for some of these same areas in terms of, you know, it could be a kid's camp or, uh, you know, some other activity uh, that, that we don't know about paddle boarding, for example, that you know, was unknown 10 years ago. So uh, I was just curious about, uh, you know, how we balance those things. Sure, no, understood. And, and I think, um, frankly, I think when you, when you look at the shoreline of Narragansett Bay proper, uh, with the exception of the basically upper Narragansett Bay and the Providence River, you know, in, in the East Providence side of the Providence River with some new uh, development like Kettle Point and the old Chevron property, the reclamation of old oil, former oil tank farms into mixed use residential development, as well as what's taken place on the west side of 
of uh, Aquidneck Island in the Portsmouth area, where there's been some new uh, development there in the northern end. There's not much has changed along the shoreline. It's it's pretty well developed in many areas with residential development and harbors. There's a lot of areas that are um, uh, like the uh, National Estuarine Research Reserve along Prudence Island and Patience Island. That will never get developed. It's in perpetuity going to be open space. So I don't expect big substantive changes along the shoreline and development, at least um, for the for foreseeable future, but we certainly need to anticipate reasonably foreseeable uses going out into the future. So thank you for that question. Right. Um, Jennifer, I wanted to also ask um, another longtime friend, Bob Rowe. I saw him here on the list. I think he's still with us. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, Bob, but um, um, I, I am certainly interested in um, your thoughts as we begin this process. Yeah, certainly. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Jim. I, you know, I'm, I'm very anxious to see this uh, move forward. I think it's time. Um, and there's a lot of ways we can go. We can go with identifying areas that are preferred use, uh, which is something that they're, they're looking at on the federal level for offshore aquaculture, aquaculture development zones, things like that. Um, and that has tended not to be very effective in, in some of the other states where it's been tried largely because the zones they pick are picked based on the fact that no one else is using it rather than this is a good place to grow shellfish. Um, we have specific needs. We already have an exclusionary process where we're, we're not allowed to farm in, in uh, navigational channels. We're not allowed to farm over submerged aquatic vegetation. Um, Obviously, water quality is, is a determinant, um, things like that. You get into the lower bay and the, there's not enough food in the water when you get probably south of South Ferry. Um, product just doesn't grow very well. So there's a lot of concerns, a lot of issues, and, and a very dynamic industry that is really quite young and is undergoing an adaptive radiation and growing techniques. The oyster grow cage was just invented 13 years ago um, and uh, was radically changed quite a bit of what we've done by um, doubling survival rates, increasing growth rates, improving product quality. So it's understandable that growers want to get into the floating gear and use these oyster grow cages when you can double your survival rate. Uh, <laughs> And yet it obviously puts us square in the crosshairs of everybody's visual impact and navigational challenges. So, um, you know, I think that there's a, a lot of uh, issues need to be examined. I'm looking forward to the process. I am also very confident that, that we are not envisioning the next new thing. Um, I know that people are developing uh, high intensity barges where you can grow uh, a, a vast quantity of, of oysters in a very small footprint if you have deep water. Um, so that's a, a, a consideration for the futurists among us. But yeah, we, we've got a lot to discuss and I probably could go on for hours and you probably don't want that. <laughs> let's, um, let's go to Julia. Julia Livermore had a question and then um, we're gonna go to the next part of the meeting. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, okay. Julia, thank you. Um, so I just had a question about what you're planning to do with the data once it's been compiled and you've identified all the things that need to be included through this stakeholder process. Is there gonna be some kind of an overlay analysis or how are you going to compare uses against one another when you have multiple uses in a single area? Yeah, Julia, what you're what you're describing is a marine spatial planning exercise, and Jen McCann um, uh, is sort of the master of marine spatial planning uh, at the university. So we're going to rely on the university's expertise and the GIS specialists at the University Environmental Data Center to help us with uh, with these various data layers to to look at. Um, uh, you know, preferential areas, if you will, for for aquaculture, and 
vet those through this process and improve upon uh, the, the map or maps as we move forward. Julia, does that answer your question or do you have a follow-up question? Uh, no, that, that was helpful, thank you. Okay, good. Thank, thank you, you everybody. And um, I, I'm sure there's more questions and um, you all have uh, Jim and Ben and my emails or phone numbers in case you have further questions. Um, what we what we wanted to go to the next phase of this is, you know, every single one of you has some expertise um, in in this area. Whether you're a professor at Brown working on coast, on uh, climate issues, or our avian experts here at URI, or um, even the and growers, and also shell fishermen, um, and what we wanted to, to we, you also have concerns and questions. And so um, what's interesting about this process is when we uh, started establishing this working group, um, a lot of researchers, both at URI, Rutgers University and other places said, I wanna be involved in this. I think this is important and I'd like to share my expertise as well. So as a component of this, you know, we talked about the process to create, establish this map. We also wanna offer a process where people are sharing their expertise and learning. And again, it's not just the, the researchers on this, on, this, um, on this Zoom, it's also potentially people who know about economic development and aquaculture that could potentially um, help communicate certain things. So what we were hoping we could do, and I don't, I don't know if I've ever done this on Zoom, but um, using the, the chat and also um, using the chat feature here in Zoom, if you guys could just write in um, answering one of three questions. One of the questions would be, what information do you wanna know about, about this topic, the aquaculture element? It could be, I really don't understand all the different gear types. I'd like to know more about that. Or could you explain in more detail the flow of Narragansett Bay, the tides and whatnot, and why that is important to aquaculture? Things like that. You could also add in your in the chat, you know, these are the concerns I have, and I'd like to know more about that. So um, we're not, you know, you're welcome to just, you know, put your concerns, but what we would really like is if you could say, I'm concerned about this and I'd like to know more about this so that it's more of a productive conversation. And then um, also, if you have expertise in something, so Scott Williams, I'm waiting for you to start writing in the chat room, your expertise, right? Um, think about what you can, what you could offer um, in this outreach. And um, think about what you're interested in or what your expertise is, but also the people you represent. We have many people who represent either um, uh, resource users or municipalities, um, what are the concerns or uh, gaps in information that you know and um, people have that you represent and you would like to know more about this. And so our idea is to have this conversation here. We will take this information and synthesize it and then send out a, a more refined survey to say, Okay, what do you want to know, know about? And then the top, the more, you know, intra, the, the, the topics that are, are most popular, we'll start with that and um, organize some education or some um, panel discussions about those specific topics. So this is your opportunity to not only to learn and ask your questions, but it's also an opportunity for you to share your expertise. So, um, you know, if we were in a room, you would have a big, you would have these big stickies and you'd be writing your names, um, your, your comments on there and putting them on the poster. We don't have that. So if you could just include it in the chat room, or if you would like to say something about that, you can also, um, thank you, Lisa, I appreciate you starting the ball rolling. You're going to come rolling in. I know it right now. Um, or if you'd like to sort of say something. Um, just put another cue in there and I will call on you. All right. 
Lisa, could, while other people are, are uh, putting their comments in, can you explain a little bit about what you wrote? So um, in Jamestown, the conversation um, from our residents has been visual disturbance of the aquaculture fields. Um, and it, as somebody said before, it's all um, opinion, I guess. So I'm wondering, I just don't know enough about the gear types. I know there are floating ones, some are 13 inches above the water, some are six inches above the water, some are you know, um, uh, flush, some are lower than the water, you know. So I guess the question is when that topic came up and when the complaints came up from the residents, um, I really didn't have enough information to say we should be requesting X, you know, or, you know, um, some are larger than others. So I think that it would be helpful um, for CRMC if, if you could help us out um, on the local level with understanding that information, um, because I think it goes a long way when they apply for these applications, if we could work with the farmers to, to really make it happen and, and make their projects more palatable, um, yeah. then I think it would be much easier on everybody. Right. If that makes sense. That's, that makes sense, it's a really good topic. Um, uh, Fred, do you want to unmute yourself and um, talk a little bit about what you wrote? Fred, yeah, there you go. Thank you. And no, I was just wondering if um, someone in the industry could give us um, some uh, indication of the different types of uh, water conditions or location conditions that would be uh, conducive to the different types of aquaculture, for example, what kind of water conditions do you need for mussels versus oysters uh, versus, I don't, I don't know if clams are grown in aquaculture today in our state, but some places they are. Okay, that's a great topic. Charlotte, do you want to unmute yourself and talk a little bit about who you represent and uh, your comment here? Hi, I'm an archaeologist with the Rhode Island Historical Preservation and Heritage Commission. So I am basically the advocate for significant cultural resources like shipwrecks or submerged Paleo Indian um, sites on the bottom of Narragansett Bay. And um, I would really like to learn more about the degree of disturbance caused by the use of different types of gear. Uh, I would like to know that if there were some types of aquaculture that wouldn't concern me because the disturbance was so minimal or other types of aquaculture that would involve substantial disturbance to the seafloor that maybe would concern me. Great. So I would like to be less ignorant basically about aquaculture. Good question. Scott, do you want to talk a bit about what you guys are doing and some expertise that maybe you could bring to the table? Yeah, hi again, everybody. Um, so again, I'm harking back to the ocean samp and one of the most um, rewarding parts of that for somebody like me who studies migratory birds was that um, we were able to bring to bear important natural resource information in that case, bird distribution and abundance um, to bear on exactly what was being done in terms of development of the ocean environment. And I'm hoping that we can do the same thing um, for the base samp, because we actually, if you know it or not, um, I know those of you who are out on the water trying to grow things that uh, some of the sea ducks like to eat on, uh, we, this is a very important bay for wintering waterfowl. And it's an important resource for many reasons. And not only would more information about bird distribution abundance be helpful for figuring out where we should and shouldn't put aquaculture, but also how we can avoid conflicts um, if we put something there. So that's the kind of information that I was having in mind when I said, what do we need to know? And uh, what do we not know enough about so that we should collect some more information about it? Okay. Scott, that, thanks. That's a great example. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking to the work that you contributed to in the ocean samp uh, for diving sea ducks, for example. So one of the issues that came up with the samp was to exclude areas uh, that were 20 meters and less 
from consideration for wind farm activity, because if you were in deeper water, you would have less likely disturbing diving uh, uh, seabirds that would be, you know, foraging for, for feed. So, uh, yeah, that could, uh, I mean, your expertise clearly will be helpful here to contribute to a better knowledge uh, of issues for uh, this effort within Narragansett Bay. If there's really important areas, I mean, the bay itself obviously is a big, uh, you know, overfly area, you know, along the East Coast, no question about it. And so there may be some really important areas of Narragansett Bay, certain shorelines that are super important, a certain water depth. So anything that you can contribute to that end uh, would clearly be very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, Charles, do you want to talk a little bit about what you wrote? You're on mute. I just want to you know, tell you about expertise I thought I might be able to contribute. So I work on models that combine dynamics, how things change in time, formally differential equation models, and, and simultaneously with data. These things are called filters, and they're good for projecting to the future. They were used, for example, to get astronauts to the moon and back at any rate. That's an expertise I can contribute. And if that's of any help, might be useful for how the flow of the uh, bay might change as we get sea level rise, or maybe for how the dynamics of the growth of oysters would happen. Great, thank you. Um, I, I haven't heard from um, Tony Texera and or Roger Tellier. Would you guys like to talk a little bit about maybe what you'd be interested in uh, learning about or some expertise you could provide? Uh, I'll start. Uh, Tony Texera, um, I'm actually the administrator in the town of Little Compton. Um, so I'm fairly new in the area. So I'm learning quite a bit from the folks here. Um, actually, I should have also as teammates, um, Robin, I mean, Mike Massa, who's been the harbor master here in the area, and Gary Maronis, who's a commercial fisherman. So they certainly have a lot more to offer, but I jumped in as uh, obviously the town administrator as part of the team. But Thanks. this has been quite interesting to listen to, uh, although I do live in Bristol, uh, so I'm very familiar with many of these things that you're discussing right now. Is there something you would you feel the people of Little Compton may or even Bristol would want to know about that we should um, have an event for? Um, I I see a couple people from Bristol, so I'm not going to speak for them specifically. Uh, for the folks of Little Compton, I certainly have to weigh in with them before we you know I uh, comment any further on that. All right, thanks. Thank Bye. you. Yep, yeah, Roger. Roger Tellier, um, uh, we're all looking at you, Roger. <laughs> I'm Roger Tellier, I'm a, I'm a recreational fisherman. I also recreational shellfish and I'm a member of the shellfish advisory panel. I would like to make sure that the recreational fishermen are represented in their, in this whole operation. I'm interested in making sure that the, their voice is heard. Basically, that's what I'm here for. Okay. Do you think it would be a good idea to have a session on recreational fishermen and what, what they do and what they need? I think it would be. I think um, some of the problems you're going to have with recreational fishermen, and they're not going to tell you where they fish. That's, uh, right. you know, the, the absolute best secret ever kept. But uh, a lot of places, and I've noticed a few times on applications where they, the applicant has said there is no activities at all in, the, in a certain area, but there are fishermen that do fish that area and quite often. Uh, that kind of concerns me a little bit, but uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to see this process getting going and I'm glad I'm going to be part of it. Great, excellent. And Marta, are you still there? Right, you you provided you're going to be you provide so much expertise to this industry. Do you want to say a little bit? 
So I think this is an excellent opportunity to integrate what we, you know, the knowledge of the industry and the people that are out in the water with what we observe, you know, scientifically and integrate that data to learn more about how, you know, those populations do in the, you know, work in the Bay. I mean, we, we have amazing data from the Bay, but sometimes it's just, look, you know, restricted to a few locations, not the whole Bay. So I think this is an opportunity to extend that knowledge to areas and also figure it out what areas we don't know a lot about, like Scott was saying, you know, what do we need to know from certain areas that we really don't have and explore as much as other areas that we know well. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to the process. Great, excellent. And um, Dan, uh, Dan Gagan, uh, you you um, made an interesting statement in the chat room. Would you like to elaborate on that? Sure, thank you, Jen. Uh, Dan Gagan, City of Warwick Planning Department. I just had a thought, when the Army Corps did the effort with CRMC for the coastal resiliency, CRMC set up almost a lightning round with the towns where each town came in for 30 minutes, met with the team, rolled out a map and aerial of the of the town, and we just went through it and identified problem areas. And I think that might be helpful for you to at least hit the major coastal towns and meet with the harbor masters uh, and whoever else in the maybe the harbor management commission, invite a few of the members, and we can just identify what's going on in our waterways and along our coastline. Great. It may help to identify any conflict areas that you should be aware of. Good point. And um, someone else who's on the call who has a lot of expertise is Eric Schneider um, from DEM. Eric, is there something that you would like to add to this conversation? Um, thanks, Jen. Hey, everyone. I'm Eric Schneider. Like Jen said, I work with the Division of Marine Fisheries. Um, and I, uh, I think collectively, the Division has a lot of talents, a lot of expertise, and there's certainly a number of aspects that we could contribute. But um, I guess I was a little hesitant to offer something specific in the chat without maybe circling back and thinking kind of more collectively with our team about exactly like what could we, you know, what could we offer, where best could we engage and support the process. But certainly, um, you know certainly very much support the effort. And I think collectively, you know, there's several folks from the Division of Marine Fisheries that will be participating and look to help, you know, support the effort. Great, thank you so much. All right, so we are also committed to ending these meetings on time. Uh, so we're gonna, uh, you know, anytime if you have any comments or questions or you have any thoughts, expertise you'd like to share, please send them our way. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about next steps, Jim and I. Um, I'm going to talk about we have been recording the session, um, and this we will um, in a few days. We will send this link out if you'd like to share it with anyone else. Um, please do so. Um, we will also be writing up uh, some brief summary notes to highlight uh, some of the conversation. Um, and it will not be verbatim, but it will be a nice summary of what's going on. And then um, we, as I mentioned, some of the, the needs and the expertise that we've heard, we will send out a, a, a short survey to get your thoughts on what, um, what kind of outreach, what kind of additional information you would like um, that would complement this process. Uh, so with that, I'm going to um, thank you all for attending and pass it to Jim Boyd, who will talk about next steps as far as the process is concerned, and then Jim will adjourn the meeting. Great. Thanks very much, Jennifer. And um, so I mentioned earlier about we had this thought of, of doing some regional meetings, West Bay, East Bay, Sakonet River, and then Dan Gagan just put forth an idea of, of meeting individually with municipalities uh, along the bay. So uh, we'll, we'll obviously consider that. It might be a good opportunity to, uh, as Dan says, uh, for a, a particular municipality along its shoreline, identify issues that they think is most important to them and potentially identify some conflicts based on the watersheet use out in front of that municipality. So we'll, 
well, think about this regional meeting versus or supplemental to individual community meetings. I know in other efforts that we, we have undertaken uh, previously, we have met with, um, uh, with individual towns or two or three towns that were occupying the same shoreline, like Aquidneck Island, for example, where we would meet with Portsmouth, Middletown, and Newport to talk about their mutual interests. So um, one thing for certain that um, we need to work on, uh, Scott McWilliams brought this up, uh, is sort of this needs assessment. We already have a scoping document for the Narragansett Bay process, and we want to refine that a bit more and think about a more detailed needs assessment and get that out uh, as a draft out to the stakeholders here to uh, add to that needs assessment. What do you believe needs to be looked at in order to do a proper evaluation? Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, Dick Pastor brought this up uh, first thing and, and, and others have brought it up throughout this meeting is uh, uh, further developing the process that we will be undertaking uh, uh, to develop this aquaculture element. So we will be working on that. We will be um, scheduling some meetings uh, within the next few, a couple of weeks here, we'll be scheduling some meetings going out into the future. My hope is that at some point, perhaps later this summer, certainly by the fall, uh, we're going to be able to meet in person, uh, which is always a more productive uh, way to meet. Uh, perhaps it's going to be um, a combination of in person and virtual. We just don't know how that's going to be developing here uh, until the university allows people to meet in large groups at the university. So more on that later, but I want to thank you all very much for participating tonight. This is really uh, an exciting uh, venture for us and, and, and one that's been anticipated for some time. And we think that with all of your collective input and other stakeholders yet to be identified that we can make this process work well and we can improve upon the CRMC's aquaculture permitting process uh, and, and allow for an aquaculture industry to continue to grow and be important to the state and be responsive to all the users on Narragansett Bay. So Jen McCann will uh, be sending out some additional information here in the coming couple of weeks. Uh, and again, thank you all very much for participating and we look forward to working with you as we move on with this process. So thank you very much and, and good night to you all. Thank you. Take care.